Hello and welcome to today's remote session. This is Tom Bechtold. I'll be your host today as we get into securing the software supply chain by following the audit trail. And I want to say thank you to the folks over at Teleport for making today's session possible. So before we get started, I, I honestly, I, I had to do some research. I was, I was reading through the, the abstract here. And there was a lot of stuff I didn't really quite understand. Uh, I'm not a, a developer. I don't do a lot with coding anymore. I used to kind of dabble in it, but uh, I'm very terrible at it. Um, but today, uh, we are going to be talking about um, the challenges of securing the software supply chain and how an S-bomb, not to be confused, I had to look this one up, not to be confused with an F-bomb, which probably happens around these things sometimes, uh, but this is a software bill of materials. I actually learned that, so I was impressed that I got something new today. So uh, it's an inter integral part of knowing what software is being included in a release, and that really is important. Uh, we're going to review the problem, how an audit log can be you know, helping with this, and making sure that your build systems are, in fact, secure. In the second half, uh, uh, one of the gentlemen is going to uh, show us how to secure CI and CD systems, as well as show us a short demo. So we've got a lot of ground to cover today. Uh, we want your questions, so please submit those as we go through in that Q&A box. Uh, definitely want to make this as interactive as possible. I do have a poll question for you here shortly, and I think uh, the gentleman might ask you some yes or no questions along the way. So if you wouldn't mind, uh, if you see a, a yes or no question pop up on your screen, please give us an answer if, uh, if you feel uh, that you want to. So anyway, uh, let's move on and uh, meet the guys, shall we? So first off, we have Mr. Donnie Hazeltine. He is the CEO of Package Cloud, and he's going to kick things off here just in a minute. Uh, we also have Ben Arendt. He is the developer relations over at Teleport. Uh, really happy to have both of these gentlemen on. I, I talked to them uh, at length yesterday, and uh, they really dazzled me with a lot of stuff that I had no clue about. So I think you guys are going to like today's session. So. That being said, I, I got to go through our housekeeping slide really fast. Uh, today's slides, some different documents, some URLs, they're available in the resource list. Uh, the two gentlemen here, um, Donnie and Ben, they gave me a, a, a really good list of a lot of links uh, that is in there. It's actually named links from Donnie and Ben in the resource tab. You want those, seriously. There's some great stuff in there. Um, there's also a couple uh, uh, case studies or uh, PDFs in there as well that have uh, some more information about uh, what's coming out. So, uh, but definitely grab those links if you can. Uh, so direct your attention back to the slides if you wouldn't mind. Uh, I've got a poll question for the audience. So, so what is your biggest software supply chain concern? You, you came here today for a reason, right? So what, what concern kind of launched that for you? Was it CI, CD getting hacked? Was it malicious third-party package or code issues that you might be having? Maybe it's an insider threat issue. Who knows? Or other. Let us know what other is. Uh, if you do choose other, if you wouldn't mind, um, throw that in the Q&A. Just put what it is. Uh, we'd love to hear what that is. So uh, just throw that out there, and we'll, we'll kind of check back with you guys on that part of it later. Uh, but let's uh, give you guys a minute or two. It looks like some folks haven't voted yet. Uh, we're looking at about 20% so far. Um, I'll just keep talking until we get enough. Vote. I'm kidding. I'm totally kidding. We'll, we'll show the results in just a second. Um, we'll give you guys just a moment more. Uh, but again, uh, what's your biggest supply chain concern? Uh, CI, CD getting hacked? Malicious third-party packages or coding inside threat actors or other? So type that out in, other, uh, in that Q&A box. We'd love to hear what that other might be. So uh, here we go. Let's take a look and see what we've got for results. So, uh, so far, the biggest thing is that malicious third-party package uh, at 66%. That's, that's quite uh, alarming, I would say. The CI, CD getting hacked. Uh, Donnie or Ben, what are you guys thinking about these results? Is this shocking to you, or is it kind of on par with what you've been seeing? I think it's uh, on par. I'll, I'll let Ben comment on there. I think, uh, you know, a lot of times, you know, especially when we take a look at just on the bottom part, uh, it's, it's, it's I always expect a little bit of another, right? Because, you know, there's always the unknown unknowns out there and they could have some specific concerns there. On the inside threat actors, I, I think that that happens a lot. We're going to talk about a couple of examples today, uh, but you uh, generally want to trust your team, right? So I think there's a natural tendency to say, I don't think it's someone on my side. Uh, so you start looking at what are the things outside that are affecting you. And really, it's not just third-party packaging tools. It's really the dependencies that we're going to talk a little more about today that tie to the SBOM. And uh, CICD, I mean, I think that uh, maybe a year or so ago, people might be might have seen this a little less, but we've seen CICD getting hacked in the past year. So I think that's probably raised some awareness up. Uh, ben, what, what do you think about those, those results? Yeah, I think this is great. I'm glad it's not all other. You know, we're going to cover these topics um, in this talk. Um, <laughs> 
you know, I think um, I would love to know what the others are, Tom, if you could share some of those and hopefully we'll cover those in the talk and probably address some examples. So um, far, one person said executive order. Oh, oh I'm Donnie has a section on that. Michelle's, yeah, I'm wondering if Michelle's talking about the executive order that just came from the um, uh, from the president on um, SBOM and requirements of SBOM for do, doing business with the government. Um, or are you talking about uh, some type of executive order? That I'm curious if, if it's more specific. Michelle, are you talking about the uh, President Biden's recent executive order or another one? We'll come back around for that nice. one. I bet that's probably yeah, what it is. Got it. Yeah, S bomb. Oh, so, yeah, yeah so is, specifically yep. about S bomb, we're going to hit that in detail. And then uh, I see uh, Craig and talks about you want to trust your team. What about the insider teams of other players in your chain? I think that's a really great point. That kind of talks to the the third party package and tools. What is your third party vendor uh, security system and, and our process? And do you really know what's out there? A lot of times you just have a vendor answer questions. You have no way to validate if they're answering those questions truthfully or not. So I think that's a great point. Definitely, definitely. Really appreciate the audience uh, so far. You guys are already engaging with us. This is, this is great. This is already kind of uh, taking shape and having a, a, an exciting kind of a discussion going on. So uh, let's move on and uh, get things kicked off. Uh, Donnie, it's you for a while. Uh, yeah, so I'm gonna just go ahead and start off uh, with the introduction. We'll go ahead and uh, jump just straight into this. Um, so first of all, Donnie Hazeltine, uh, I come from a, a military background then shifted into cybersecurity uh, with a uh, PE firm called Xenon Partners of which Package Cloud is a part. And now I'm currently running as the CEO and general manager of Package Cloud. And uh, let me throw over to Ben real quick for just a quick intro. Thanks, Tony. Yeah, hi, everyone. I'm Ben Arendt. I'm on the developer relations team at Teleport. Um, I have a background in developer-focused SaaS tools. And um, one interesting link here, I have a link here for securing open source infrastructure. And this is sort of an initiative that we have that's sort of providing a free service to the open source community to sort of secure a lot of their aspects of their infrastructure. Um, and we'll sort of touch on some of these topics. But I might sort of dive straight into it. Um, you know, we're going to talk about the supply chain, the software supply chain, but I figured I'd step back a bit. And there's a famous economist called Michael Friedman, and he talks about everything that you need to make a pencil, and no one person can make a pencil. And actually, I had to find a pencil because all I had was <laughs> a stylus. But for everything from the wood, so you have to get the you have to plant the trees to get the wood, and then you need uh, the iron for the saw. You need the graphite, which is in a mine, and then you need to assemble it. And so you think a pencil is a relatively simple object, but the free market has to make the pencil. And that's sort of the same thing applies to um, the supply chain. We have raw materials, suppliers, manufacturers. You can't really get full visibility into what everything is happening. and to some degree, this is also true for the software supply chain. We have a similar sort of process. You go from, um, you know, getting your raw materials, which could be sources and dependencies, your factory, sort of your build systems and your engineers. You have to ship it, which is sort of, do you trust the network? Your storefront, which could be application repositories. And then last up, you sort of deploy these systems. And depending where you fit, you know, there's supply chains within, some, within supply chains. Um, and I think Donnie will sort of touch on this sort of aspect. So similar to the pencil, you know, there might be a very small library that you have. You think, oh, it's just two dependencies, but there might be a lot more behind the scenes. And one thing that is probably different in 2022 is the discussion sort of changed a lot. Traditionally, you know, the last five or six years, we had lots of discussions around like we don't trust these products like Huawei or um, Russian antivirus software, like we can't just use these. But of late, we've seen we can't necessarily trust American made software because, you know, in the example of SolarWinds, there was a, a nation state attack in the um, CICD system, which sort of compromised a sort of very trustworthy piece of software. And I think, uh, Donny, you're going to go in a bit depth for this one. Yeah. Thanks, thanks, Ben. Yeah, so I want to break that out a little further. So if you look at you know at Ben's initial one, we just talked about a couple of the key pieces to kind of elucidate that software supply chain. I want to break it a little forth and a little further out. And realistically, there's really even could be a deploy in deployment integrity on the far right side of this. 
This is adapted from a Google security blog through a project uh, package cause working with them on. But um, you know, you start with a developer, and I think a lot of times we just think specifically at that realm, but you will have a number of other steps to get that software out. And the real issue with that is every one of those steps is a problem, and a, uh, or a potential problem. And we've already seen the comments here, a, uh, a great comment when Ben talked about the traditional logistics supply chain. That is very well documented, Craig, and they made this really great point, but the software supply chain is less documented, and that is absolutely true. And I think that we also find uh, in software is the ability to pull a lot of disparate pieces out, and uh, it's very hard to understand what's in those pieces out there. And if you look across this entire supply chain, every one of these components has been attacked. I mean, if we're to take a look at uh, the uh, the first one, submitting bad code. Uh, case last year, about a year or so ago, when um, the University of Minnesota did some Linux hypocrite commits. They did, attempted to intentionally introduce code vulnerabilities through the Linux kernel by using patches. Um, and they, they were able to get those in before they were caught and, and stopped. Uh, Compromise and source control. In this case, uh, for the uh, PHP self-hosted Git server, attacker compromised that and was able to put two malicious commits in directly in. Uh, Webmin, when you talk about modifying code, they were able to build, uh, attackers were able to modify the infrastructure, so it started using source files that didn't match the source control. This one that everyone knows about, Ryad, the SolarWinds hack, Sunspot, is when the actual build platform for updates was uh, compromised. Once you get that software out in the wild, it's obviously calling back out um, on uh, calling back out to dependencies. And in this case, uh, attacker added an innocuous dependency that was able to connect to the software. And then once the software was out in the wild, he's able to modify that dependency to basically push uh, malicious code into uh, into the software. The uh, code cov breach, which occurred last year, where there were leaked credentials. Uh, that we're able to upload a malicious artifact to a uh, Google Cloud uh, storage bucket. And then when you look at package managers like, like ourselves, like Package Cloud, there was a way to uh, run some mirrors for several package repositories, which were able to basically direct someone to a, uh, a malicious site that gave compromised uh, software out. This is a really fascinating one that really got us interested into it, Alex Pearson's dependency confusion attack. And uh, what he did here was really interesting. Uh, I think there's another term they'll use called uh, typo squatting, and where what they what he did was he noticed that many of these major companies and major software, um, their dependencies called out to private uh, repositories and private dependencies. He was able to make public ones that mirrored the name, and in many cases, your software will default to the public version. And when that happened, he was able to open a door to inject malicious code. Thankfully, it was a white hat researcher reported it, and a lot of these got patched, but it also shows how fragile that ecosystem is. So thanks, Donnie. Really, yeah, I'll turn it to Ben. For this. Uh, are you going to take this one? No, no. Um, I, I was just, um, I, I was just, I was just kicking off to say these three things. But go ahead, Ben. No, you, you can go ahead. Really, as we said on this last slide, there's a lot of ways you can compromise software supply chain. We're going to focus in on three today: uh, CI/CD and Meatware, and then also SBOM. So I know we had some comments about the executive order that is now requiring uh, companies to actually generate these SBOMs. And then um, Ben's going to talk about CI/CD and meet and some other ways that that can be a problem. So I'll turn it over to Ben here. Yeah, thanks, Anna. Craig, I like your comment. You know, they often say in the restaurant industry, you said bad code, malicious, or just poorly written. They say you can either have it good, fast, or cheap, but you can only pick two. And I think that kind of applies to software. You know, um, this is not this is regardless of all three of them, but ultimately, you know making good secure software is pretty tough. And I think that's kind of why some of these examples um, that we'll go through can have different solutions to them. And there's not necessarily one solution to all problems, but these are three that we sort of brought up that are sort of interesting. And uh, uh, Meatware is sort of like a semi-hacker term to refer to, you know, people are in the machines. And, um, you know, ultimately, you know, people are writing code, people are accessing systems, often people are their um, weakest link. And, you know, in the cyber domain, you know, they're inside of threats. And I think one that was pretty interesting, um, Ubiquity, which is a, a router company, they were hacked, but it actually, there was a, they were hacked, but uh, inside actually said that a whistle, he came as a whistleblower, it's like, oh, well, our company has been hacked and he, someone was demanding a ransom and he leaked it as a whistleblower. But actually what happened was he had hacked, he'd basically downloaded everything 
gave them a ransom and said, oh, I'm trying to extort so many Bitcoin for giving this data. And so this is a very interesting insider threat who had access to a wide amount of systems, um, which he shouldn't have. And, you know, this could be mitigated by, you know, better monitoring of the network, um, see if there's data exfiltration, you know, endpoint protection would help. And just generally applying principles of least trust is sort of a good place to start. And then next up, we also have, you know, you know, all of these systems have people in them. So, and there's also like outsider threats. So this happened um, in January um, that a open source JavaScript developer said he made a political statement to break thousands of apps. So he deliberately corrupted his NPM package because he was sort of annoyed and frustrated that open source maintainers don't get paid. Probably not the best way to get paid <laughs> is to corrupt your package. There's probably better ways to do this. But, you know, this could be mitigated in the node ecosystem. It's a little tougher to deal with like vendoring and um, pinning dependencies because many developers will often run like a NPM update locally, which can cause all other sort of havoc in itself. And actually in this case, GitHub have the centralized maintenance of NPM and they actually like pinned it to an older package. So it reduced those um, packages from breaking. And I think this is sort of interesting and Donnie will go into this, that you may not necessarily think you're using colors or faker, but um, this could be a dependency to something else, and then it could completely break your you know, deployment um, pipeline. And then moving on to CI, CD, you know, there's lots of attacks. Um, Donnie gave a few examples. And actually, this is one that we uh, publicly disclosed at Teleport. And this is sort of an interesting one because um, we have a blog post here of how you could access our cloud infrastructure via a pull request. And this is because many CI CD servers have uh, a lot of privilege and you can do lateral movement across services. And so, um, like, why is it important to secure them? You know, often your CI CD is sort of the source of truth for your build. And you want to be able to create a sort of atomic builds, which you can trust. And so you need to have complete trust in your like CI CD service. And so there's a few things that we did to um, reduce this possible attack. By the nature of getting other people's code into your code, you're potentially opening up um, possibility for someone to inject something bad. The code reviews are for external PRs is good. We actually put in a new bot system. So two people have to approve any external PRs coming in, which is a very unique situation for open source projects, but we also work with some of our customers and vendors. And then also just locking down your CI CD services. So there can't be lateral movement between um, build containers and images. And then also just generally vendoring your dependencies can be um, a useful way to deal with some of the possible S bomb attacks. And then I think Donnie, you're going to talk about the SolarWinds CI CD attack. Yeah. Yeah. Ha happy to. So just to give a quick broad overview of this, and this occurred, um, you know, last year. And I think one of the things that to notice about this is, is first, when, when you talk about actual um, major breaches and, and hacks, it's important to understand that there's, especially when they deal in this case where they're from an APT or an advanced persistent threat, they, they've been over there for time. The persistent part of that APT is because they've actually gotten in and have been in, in, in your network for, for quite a while. So I think in this case, um, I think September 2019 is when, we, in, in retrospect, due to the postmortem, uh, threat actors initially were able to gain access to the SolarWinds internal network. And then they started testing ways to inject code into their Orion product. Uh, the code got injected in February 2020. The update that SolarWinds pushed that tens of thousands of people downloaded uh, was pushed out in March. And uh, FireEye first caught wind of it by by seeing some malicious traffic in their in their network in December and then announced it. And that's when we kind of, this all blew up in, in December, 2020. So it, it was there for a while. And, and it's important to understand when you think about uh, defensive points, I'm gonna go a little bit into the cybersecurity piece here, is understanding the cyber kill chain, which understands the process with which someone needs to use to actually go through a malicious code inject. It starts out reconnaissance and doing research. Then once they figure out a way to do it, you start weaponizing that back door, you find a way to deliver it into the software. Once it's delivered and working, then you try to exploit it. 
and you go through this installation, command and control back to the malicious actor, and then work eventually to get hands on keyboard where they have full control of your network. And in this case, um, that attacker at the top part there, they were able to compromise that and compromise a very specific DLL file that was used for updates for the, uh, the Orion Core uh, business platform. And that effectively opened a back door. So if I were a customer of SolarWinds, I downloaded their software. Once I downloaded that update, it created a back door. That software then started doing research inside and reconnaissance uh, inside uh, the target network. And then eventually called back out and kind of gave a report uh, back to the hackers. From there, they were able to go back and forth and eventually pull in additional credentials, make lateral movement in that network, and then allow the attackers to get specific access to that individual network. And then they began to prioritize which organizations they had access to and start trying to do uh, direct access to their networks and see what they could steal or exploit. So this is a very, very complex attack, uh, but it's important to understand like how many steps in the process occurred and how long it took for this actually to be a to be exploited. Um, so with that, I'll just jump into the, the, the first, the, the last piece. Ben talked a little about CICD. We talked about the human element with meatware. Uh, the S bomb is, is something that's really come to uh, uh, come really come to the forefront right now, mainly uh, because, as Michelle noted, uh, President Biden's executive order. This is something that had been pushed for a while, uh, and CISA, Jenny Easterly, and the CISA team did a great job at informing the White House and getting this out there which is specifically that if you're gonna do business with the federal government, uh, you need to basically have an SBOM and have it published and have it accessible. So you have a, just shows you have an understanding of what's actually in your software. It's important to know that the, the SBOM is a list, right? Uh, it doesn't necessarily give you full comfort, but it gives you a sense of what's out there. So moving forward, why is this important? And I think Ben gave a great example of the pencil early on, but I mean, if you just think about it, like think about something like the food we eat. You can look on the back of any pet food package and see every ingredient. You know, if you have a specific dietary concern or, or preference, you can look very quickly and say, am I eating something I don't want to be eating, right? Um, what are my calories? What are these different vitamins here? But software doesn't really have that. The S-bomb is really that piece to say, these are all the things that are involved in this. Or if you were to take Ben's pencil example, here's a list of all the suppliers and all the different components that actually contribute to this small low piece of tech that we use every day. So the real question you need to be asking is, is do we know where our code comes from? And I think a lot of times when we talk about um, really reputable large companies, we think, oh, well, it's secure because they, you know, they, they have control over it and they're the ones who write that code. But as Ben kind of hinted at earlier on is that code is probably made up of a lot more things out there. And that's where it gets a little scary because 90% of all software is composed of open source dependencies which means when you download something from a reputable company and a secure company that, that takes it seriously, only about 10% of code is really the customized code that they wrote and they fully, fully controlled with their developers. The rest of it is, is really out in the wild. And uh, this is a great cartoon from XKCD that I love because there's a lot of stuff in the internet, the internet hangs on uh, that we just don't quite realize. And a really great example of that happened, I think 2016, where a developer had written a whole bunch of these little quick small uh, code uh, libraries and published them to the NPM registry and others. And he got in a, in a dispute with NPM because a, uh, he had a project and a company that had that trademark name wanted to basically uh, take control over it and wanted him to kind of drop the name of that project. And uh, it was really probably done very, very bluntly and not very nicely. And he got mad. So he said, fine. NPM basically came back and said, yeah, we're going to forcibly change your project name. He got mad. So he just unpublished all the software he had written over, over many, many years. It just so happened there was one 11 line piece of code called left pad, which just lines up things on a website that most of the internet used. And as soon as he unpublished that from the NPM registry, just companies all over the world just broke. Websites crashed, like the internet broke for a few hours until someone just quickly figured out what it was and rewrote the 11 lines of code and republished it. So this is just a, a small, point you're like well why this guy gets in an argument with a bigger company and you think how does that affect me well it affects you because of these open source dependencies and i'll just try to give you another visual example of what this means you know when we look at package cloud we have a lot of customers and we have a lot of um uh we have a lot of vis visibility on their repositories and we try to work with them to help them see where they might have issues uh the real concern and ben hinted this earlier is that some of these dependencies we're stepping out of that initial software the open source dependencies, 
But some of those dependencies now have indirect dependencies, which are even, a little bit scarier. So we'll just take a look at this. This is a small piece of software in the NPM registry. It's used by a lot of people, several of our customers out there. And if you look in the registry, you see, okay, it was published four years ago. It's been updated once or so, and it has two dependencies, very small, simple piece of code. And that's great. You know what, that clues me that I need to look at those two dependencies and just make sure they're secure. The problem comes when you peel back that onion, you find out there's 102 dependencies to those two dependencies. So what you thought was just a small little piece of software that you can kind of take a look at and see, is that a problem? You find really looks like this. And, and this is used by uh, Google's depth.dev, dev, uh, depth which is in, in the links, where you can type in open source dependencies and visualize them. But it just gives you an idea of how big the problem is. So in large pieces of software, that have hundreds of dependencies, they have thousands of indirect dependencies. And if you are really trying to secure that, you've got to understand that when you're building your SBOM, you want to know what each of those individual things are and make that list. And it can be a very, very comprehensive and long and in some cases brutal list. But why that's important is so you know where your software comes from, you can communicate that with your customers. And then when something happens like uh, Log4j, for example, uh, many, when that, when that, when that uh, issue just popped last year, many didn't even know that they actually used that individual log4j dependency. So having an SBOM allows you to very quickly see, oh, what we are using, this is where we're using it, and then move to the next steps of basically trying to seal that up and protect uh, protect yourselves. And um, I'm just going to briefly cover in uh, what should be in an SBOM. There's a couple different formats, uh, common formats for SBOM. There's really three of them that are out there. Uh, there's SBDX, which is the software package exchange, uh, data exchange. There's a SWID, a software identification tag, and there's Cyclone DX. And I think we have some links in that, but those are ways you can, they're open source. You can go in and help use those to build uh, build your SBOMs. But these are really the key pieces that are in the SBOM. And if you look, this is a link to, uh, to the NTIA report, which just says, this is what you have to have in it. So when you talk about the executive order, you need a list of all the components of your software. And each one of those components, you need this information on so you can actually uh, be sure of what's in your software, look harder at securing it, and then move from there. Um, so I'll just pause there uh, and maybe just do a quick pulse check because I think we've uh, we've kind of covered the meat of what we're going to talk about, and we're going to slide in to talk a little bit about some of the things, some of our experiences at Package Cloud and dealing with this problem, and then Ben's going to talk a little bit about experiences at Teleport at this problem. So I think you guys should see it. I just want to make sure everyone's follow along if there's any other questions that uh, you want us to hit on right now where we have a quick natural stopping point or pause points. I think they might, might have gotten a little shy on us a little, uh, or they're pondering right, some there we questions. Go. <laughs> I was That's just checking, giving them the mic to see. Yeah, we'll uh, I did want to mention uh, for the audience members real quickly, um, we did upload the slides. Uh, you may have to refresh to get to them. Uh, it was a little bit after we started, so I apologize for that. We didn't have the PDF uploaded in time for the, the start. Uh, but yeah, send in any questions you have now. Uh, anything coming in? Let's see here. Kind of quiet. That's okay. Let's continue. Tony, on, I have right? a question for you. Oh, yeah, good. Go ahead, Ben. So, um... If there's this new executive order, what sort of time frame do people need to address it, and which companies have to go about this S bomb uh, duty? Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I was just looking at it and I'm blanking out on the time frame, Ben. But the key thing is, is it's it's specifically saying anyone who does business with the federal government. So it's all the software companies in the federal government. And it's also the main timeline was telling all the government agencies to basically ensure that they had a list of the software they used. And obtain S bombs in that time frame. So it's mainly directed um, at the at the government uh, because with the U.S. system, it's a little hard for us to without passing a actual law. Uh, so if you're a company that doesn't do business with the government, then you probably have a little more room. But it's still a really great um, practice, and that's what we're trying to highlight as a way to know what your code's made out of, so you can better protect yourself. Yeah, and so I guess people who are doing uh, FedRAMP certification. It will likely Absolutely. just be as part of that to keep their um, compliance in check. As I talked to someone recently, you never obtain compliance, you only lose it. So this is probably the case in which you... That, that's great. It's, 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 you probably need to look at it as, as a continuous process, right? Because I think realistically, um, once you, it's not... A, this is one of the challenges with, with some things like SOC 2, right? Is 
You know, there's type one where it's a moment in time. There's the type two, which looks over six months. But even over six months, you know, you have um, you have gaps in that. No one's constantly watching all the time. Um, <clears throat> yeah, there's a couple great yeah, questions see, in there. Um, Tony, just repeat the question just for people. Yeah, sure, absolutely. So the first one is S bomb can be used in cloud and on-prem devices, additionally installed in all endpoints. Like, yeah, look, any piece of software can have an S bomb, whether it's on cloud or on-premise. And I think that's one of the beauties of, of open source projects, right? The reason why I think a lot of software developers and a lot of security professionals like open source projects is because the code is in the open. Uh, this is especially true when you talk about cryptographic standards, right? We get very nervous when someone says, I have this new encryption thing, but is not willing to show people how it works because if you don't show me how it works, there's no way for me to prove that it's actually secure. So there's an aspect of that that's actually really important. When you talk, uh, Kiwi has a great question about, are there IP concerns? And and I think there are. Uh, I think there are some companies that have SBOMs that will only distribute it under NDA to existing customers. Um, so I think that there is that. There is some concern about, do I publish my SBOM publicly or do I, I kind of keep it uh, keep it close hold and deal with it when I need to. Uh, those are business decisions, obviously. But I think that as we pointed out, the real key point is is understanding all those other components you're not directly building. So if there is a piece of code that your company internally develops on their own, it's their IP that they have built on their own, you're really talking about that small percentage of the code, right, that, that you built on your own that really wouldn't be in the SBOM. You would put, you know, custom code, we developed it. But the other piece is, is when you distribute that, it's not actually saying, you're not showing the source code, you're just saying like, these are dependencies that I use that make up my source code. So I think that's one of the ways that you you get past it uh, is you're not necessarily showing your, your actual source code and your IP, you're just saying these are the pieces of the pie. So to use Ben's example, you're saying I use graphite and I use graphite from these mines or I use rubber from these mines for the eraser. I use woods from these forests but you're not going through how you actually assemble uh, that, that pencil on the backside. Um, Julian Cregan, he says, SBOM content provision of clients and IP protection must be all explicit and absolutely in contract language. This would be something that would be in your, your master services agreement. Um, certainly if there's any concerns, if it's not fully open source, you'd want this uh, probably under NDA. Um, and so you have some ability to control over it, but it's important to have that in contract language. And then Mark said, how much resources does it consume? That's an interesting point. And, and maybe I'm, I want to make sure I'm understanding your, your comment or question, Mark, is is it the resources to build the SBOM? Because that is certainly an issue. It's It can be time intensive. And that's why there's some products out there that will help you um, generate it. The uh, But are you talking about how many resources your software consumes once you've deployed it? Just want to make sure I understand that. But uh, Okay, I see John's asking about that. John, we'll get information to you on the um, on the uh, on the slides. And okay, Mark, res machine resources. So yes, uh, I don't know that SBOM requires you to say this is the type of machine resources they use, and I think that's probably variable based off of the machine. But I think that's a really interesting point. And I think we've all seen that, right? When we see our machine slowing down because of a piece of software, um, what's interesting about that is, is if you see it slowing down, that's indication of other problems, right? We all know that. So the SBOM would give you an idea of being able to look in and what other pieces of that software might be putting a drag on that. Um, let me just push on here and we'll continue to answer questions as they come in, but I'm gonna briefly just say what Package Cloud is and how we're kind of working with customers to address some of these things. And then I'm gonna hand off to Ben to do the same thing for Teleport and talk about how he, uh, he works with them. So Package Cloud uh, is a unified way to manage all of your software ar ar artifacts in any language. One of the things you will see is we have some customers that have a very specific, like they just released Debian packages or they released a, uh, a Maven package. If you're building in our infrastructure to distribute those packages, you have to build it kind of separately. One of the nice things about Package Cloud is you can put all those repositories in one place, which gives your developers and your security team and your quality assurance team one place to look at all of your outward facing software that you're handing off to your customers. We, uh, we do this in the cloud. We also do it on-prem for customers that want to do it, either distribute it internally on their infrastructure or even distribute externally to customers using their own infrastructure. This usually sits at the end of that CI CD workflow. So when we think about the software supply chain, it's on the far right side of that slide. And we really just want to make sure we're giving a very fast and simple service 
where software developers can get their software out very quickly and efficiently. But in doing that, when we see some of the problems we've talked about today, we notice that almost all of our customers um, are starting the left side and looking left to right. Because we're on the far right-hand side, we have a unique ability to really look right to left on that software supply chain. And I think that the thing that we're also looking at is it's not that we're just protecting, trying to protect our customers, we're really trying to give visibility and help protect our customers' customers. Because once they deploy that software through us, their customers are the ones downloading it, right? And we have that piece of if there is a breach or problem with that software down the road, you know, that could that could hit on us, it could also hit on them. So other things that we can do at our through point where that software flows through, where we can provide better visibility. And um, that's caused us to rewrite a pretty aggressive 2022 roadmap on this, to add a few things, specifically the SBOM, like we talked about. Uh, we've also looked at doing a single point of control for dependencies. Now we see some of our larger customers uh, like GitLab, GitHub, Netflix, uh, they have very, very big security teams that are super aggressive and we have a great conversations and working with them. And they're able to handle a lot of this on our own. We have a lot of smaller customers that don't have the resources to do all this. So because we're holding your software repository and those artifacts, can we take those artifacts and help you get an SBOM out of it? Can we also said that once you've deployed it out to your customers, instead of calling out to the wild where a malicious inject, either mistake or malicious, now infects your customers through your software, can we point all of that, those dependencies through Package Cloud where we can internally review, mirror, and scan for vulnerabilities to make sure that your customers are only getting not just the approved software, but the approved dependencies that you put your stamp of approval on. And then to help those developers um, in, the, in, our, in our customers, given the ability to go back and look very closely at the code ancestry. So not just your code, the IP that you've built, but look at in that IP that you've built, what are verified commits, what are unverified commits, what are the reputation scores of the developers involved here, but then take it a step further and look at all those open source packages. So you might see a uh, an individual with a, who's only been on GitHub for two weeks and has done no uh, deployments, so he suddenly drops like five or six pull requests in an open source dependency. We would flag that as probably a low reputation and something we should look at a little closer there. So these are the pieces that we're adding to the platform in 2022 to try to do a better job of handling some of these security things and give our customers a little more firepower uh, to, to handle it. And uh, Craig, thanks, you dropped the executive order link in there. Um, we will uh, see if we can add those links to the uh, to the resources. Uh, so appreciate you adding that in there. And then obviously if you search for America's supply chain, transportation industrial base, or uh, Biden's executive order uh, 14017 of February, 2021, those will give you uh, some of the data you need. So we'll see if we can add those, those links there. Um, let me hand off to Ben to talk a little bit about Teleport and kind of the pieces they're doing on their side to, uh, to, to secure the supply chain. Thanks, Donny. Um, I'm really excited for your 2022 roadmap. I think, um, well, we'll dive into it afterwards. So let me just dive into what is Teleport. Um, so Teleport is the easiest, most secure way to access all your infrastructure. And we're also interesting, we're like an open source, open core company. So all of our development happens in the open in GitHub. And that sort of alludes to why we had this malicious pull request. So we sort of run into some of the issues that sort of Donnie mentioned. But what does that really mean? So, you know, nowadays developers and teams have a myriad of resources from multiple clouds. You know, we started off providing just SSH service credentials, but nowadays people are accessing Kubernetes clusters, databases, like web front ends, and then you have multiple teams across multiple clouds. And it becomes much more difficult to access all of this infrastructure in a standardized way across all of these different clouds. And we see this sort of broken down into what we call them um, four main uh, essential elements of uh, access. The first is just connectivity. And, you know, this may seem sort of relatively simple if you, you know, just have one AWS account, but multiple people have multiple AWS organizations, or we see people who have edge devices, or you're deploying software into a hospital, or, um, you know, we even have people who like have teleport in cars. It's amazing where, you know, machines are and who gets access. And the first step is authentication, just proving that uh, myself, Ben, has access to these machines. And then it's once I'm authenticated, am I actually authorized to access those machines? 
And if I can access those machines, how long can I access it for? And I think this kind of goes back to the Ubiquiti hack. He was authorized, he was authenticated to access the Ubiquiti network, but probably wasn't authorized to download all of the code. Um, and that's just due to, you know, not having that much, uh, not deploying like principles of least trust. And then last up, um, a very key part is just auditing, you know, you need to know what people are doing in these systems. And I think something I'm going to touch on later is also like, what are systems doing to other systems? Because it's not always a human. It can be also machine to machine interaction. And then to just break it down, you know, Teleport is access plane. You know, we deploy sort of zero trust. We're certificate based. And I'll sort of go into what this means. And then providing just in time access to only provide the resources when you need them. And then also just getting the complete visibility and creating the order log, which you can then pipe into your SCIEM or other um, tools to know what's happening. And then, you know, we cover all of these resources. So um, databases, servers, Kubernetes clusters, desktops, and applications. And so you can really secure and take these devices off the internet, provide basically very secure, easy access to for developers, but make it very easy to get access to. So I have this slide on how Teleport works, but I'm going to skip over this one and sort of talk about, you know, one of the problems with, uh, I think there's a transition here. Okay, so with sort of traditional keys or passwords. So let's say Bob is hired and he joins, he gets his new laptop, he runs SSH keygen, he now has a public private key. Maybe an Ansible script gives his, um, public key into all servers, so he has access. If Bob is terminated, you know, you may have to run your script again or remove that key from those servers. Like he might still have access to the resources once he leaves. And we see this across a lot of our customers. You know, once an employee is onboarded, it's much easier to onboard people onto the systems than necessarily the cleaning up and removing them for all of those systems. Um, Back in the days of working in a corporate HQ, you know, security would like unplug you from the computer, escort you off the office. You no longer have access to the network. But nowadays with everyone working from home, everyone has complete access to the network. So it's much harder to sort of stop um, their access. And this is sort of where um, SSH certificates come in. This is a feature that's been around in OpenSSH for a while. And instead of using sort of long lived public private keys, Teleport um, builds on top of OpenSSH's certificates. So we issue short-lived certificates for access. So, you know, Bob is employed at the beginning of his career. Maybe he takes a few weeks of onboarding. Five weeks in, he logs into Teleport. Then he only gets an eight-hour certificate for access. And then this is only available for his window. If Bob is fired, you know, he doesn't have access anymore. First, he would have to authenticate um, and get access to it. So I'm going to do a quick demo for the human aspect here, because um, I always love a live demo. And I have to flip this over. Great. So this is the um, web UI. You know, we support a full terminal. I'm going to authenticate with GitHub. And here I have an inventory of all of my machines. So if I come in um, here. You see what I've done, I've, I've just logged in as the root user. And this has executed a PAM script, it sort of told me that um, all activity has been recorded. This actually has PAM, which creates the user. Um, so, you know, you can go about just using this host as you would um, normally. There's other benefits you can like share and do other things, but I'm going to just exit this. And in our audit log, you can see that I have the session and this session ended. And I think another benefit here is we have a session recordings, which is a almost like a DVR for your terminal. And so along with, you know, raw output, it's very easy to just go in and sort of watch what happened and see what um, an individual did. And this is the same for both um, Kubernetes, um, databases, and desktops. Databases are a pretty interesting one because, you know, servers, 
in sort of the modern era, you know, was seen as cattle instead of pets. And so there's less sensitive data on them. But when you provide someone, um, you know, access to your Postgres database, there's potentially lots of valuable information in there. And um, the same, we also have support for um, Windows desktops. Um, so you can cover all of your um, access needs. So I'm going to stop this demo. I'm back. And so let's talk about, you know, we've seen the human sort of meatware. Let's talk about the human aspect. And this is sort of a similar problem as I went before. So for machine access, you set up your Jenkins server or whatever CI CD service you have. You create keys for it, public private keys to all of your build infrastructure. You know, you probably set it up a while ago. It's a while since it's rotated. No one wants to touch the build system. And then there's like a Docker vulnerability. People get access to the machines. They get root. They get the SSH key. Next thing you know, the CPU is going crazy, and you find out the keys were leaked on GitHub, and they are um, mine like crypto mining on the machine. And so, did we rotate them? What happens here? Like this point in the ops lifecycle, you know, it's not broke, so you, you don't fix it. And then there's this big scramble to rotate your keys and sort of trust the machine to machine access. Um, I think there's time for a question, Tom, if you want to ask one. Feel free to ask me questions as we sort of go through this. And so this is a new problem that we've solved at Teleport. Um, and we're solving this by providing the same short-lived credentials for machine access. So instead of using public private keys, you can use um, Tbot, which is an open source project to create and issue new short-lived certificates. And what's pretty cool about this project is it's another open source project in which um, Tbot will automatically renew certificates for you on whatever case you need. So. This is sort of an example of our script. I won't dive into it, but it will always renew certificates every 24 hours or whatever period you like to really make um, getting renewed certificates very easy. Just to review, um, Teleport is a new machine-to-machine um, -machine bot that we have sort of in alpha. Um, it's not available yet, but it'll be coming out in Teleport 9. If you're interested in this, and this is a problem you run into, um, please reach out to me. I'm ben at goteleport.com. Um, it will also have the audit log for this machine-to-machine -machine access. And another capability, which is super interesting, is the ability to lock the renewal of certificates centrally. And I think that's sort of that kill chain, which, going back to Donnie's point of the SolarWinds hack, once you realize that you've been compromised, how do you lock and remediate these actions? All right, I'm going to take a pause, go to Donny. Um, I think we can go through some of these um, other projects that are interesting. Actually, real quick, guys, can I just pop in really fast? I want to back up just for a second. Um, I, I'd actually kind of want to do a, a, a pulse check with the audience here. Uh, you had a very gracious offer uh, for this uh, new uh, item that you guys have. So if you guys are actually interested in this, um, I'm going to send a pulse check out. Um, Please hit yes or no if you are interested in learning more uh, from Ben on this uh, cool new item. So uh, please uh, uh, go ahead and make your choices now. We'll give you guys a, a few seconds here to make a choice, uh, but we'd certainly love to uh, send you guys more information if it's appropriate. Uh, but let's uh, do that and then I'll end that. And sorry to butt in, but I just wanted to give that an option for uh, the folks in the audience. So there you go. Back to you. Thank you, Ben. Thanks, Tom. Yeah, th thanks, Tom. Yeah, I'll just hit the, the bottom three, and then I think uh, Ben has some of the top ones there. But the three I put in there that are, that are kind of interesting is, is uh, the Linux Foundation's SPDX. That's just one of the ways you can basically create uh, SBOMs. So it's one to look at. Uh, you can very quickly find the others. If we, I think they're in the others are in the uh, links we shared, but that's a way to take a look at it if you don't have an SBOM or need to think about how to do it. Um, two big things that we've worked with Google on is, is Salsa, which is software um, supply chain levels for software artifacts. Uh, we're starting to work on a basically a matrix of all the things you need to do in different levels so that when you download software, you know that that chain has been checked and verified. And um, they also have another open source project, depths.dev, and that, that's where you can kind of 
look up common open source dependencies and then get that quick information back. If you, uh, for example, see you're using open source dependency, you want to quickly learn about it, type it in there. You can see a graph of all its sub dependencies and you get all the information on whether there's a current uh, CV associated with it. So Ben, do you want to just cover the uh, the top ones you yeah. added? Yeah, I'll keep going up from the bottom. So uh, Panther, SIM, you know, this is another product that we use. Um, you know, I think it's great to have all this like audit log of activity, but it's also good to have a system to reduce the noise. Um, you know, we're just sort of friendly with the guys, no direct relationship, we just love the product. Um, another interesting project is reproducible builds. Um, you know, I think it's very important that the software that you build is sort of true and the idea is that other people can create the same software. Um, so there's a great project here. Package Hunter is a similar project for compromised packages. Um, there's a great blog post from GitLab. And then last up, Sigstore is another new, um, I think it's a CNCF project now for both signing and distributing projects um, in an open source manner. And they're relatively new, they're just getting started, but um, another good community project. So moving on, oh, I think I went a step too far. Uh, sorry, I think we clicked it at the same time, Ben. There we go. And it looks like the format oh, yeah. is a little jogged here, but uh, but we just want to put out ways you can contact both us and our teams, um, either directly at support, our link. Please follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter. Our community slacks are there. You're welcome to join there and ask direct questions there. And then uh, I think Ben already gave his email. I'm Donnie at packagecloud.io. Excellent, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I've got some questions here uh, that I've got uh, for you uh, as I was making, taking some notes. Uh, audience members, we've got time for your questions as well. So if you have a, a, a burning question that we haven't gotten to yet, uh, just throw that in the, the Q&A. Uh, but my first one here, uh, let me pop over to my notes. Um, what would you guys consider, if you, if you can make the recommendation, uh, what would be like, in your mind, the most secure CI CD platform uh, or, you know, Maybe throw a couple of them out there. Anybody? I think it's a great I, question. I, I, I always, I always have, yeah. Go, go, ben, I just got to, my only caveat is like, I always get from the cybersecurity standpoint, get nervous and say, what's the most secure one out there? Because, you know, you always have to assume they've been breached, right? So I don't mean that's right. not an insult. I'm not saying I know some secret information. But, uh, but the key thing is, is maybe asking the questions like, what does their process look like? Can you validate their, what, what their security processes are? You validate their S bomb, but but then you've got more specific experience with them, so I'll let you jump in there. Sorry to interrupt. No, I think that's great. So you know, you probably have to evaluate whether you're looking for a hosted provider or one that you run yourself, um, because you know there's benefits of running it yourself, but then there's also the maintenance overhead. So I think this kind of comes to Amazon's shared responsibility model which is basically everything. So like Amazon is responsible for securing the data center, but you're ultimately responsible for, you know, making sensible IAM credentials. Um, and I would apply the same thing for looking for CICD services. Okay, excellent. Uh, and along those lines, um, since, you know, kind of making some kind of recommendations, um, what's a good tool for alerting and remediation um, for when an attack does happen? That's, that's another great question, Tom, and it really depends on a lot of different things, right? There's, so there's, you know, at, let's just talk at the, at the most basic level, right? Um, if you're, for example, if you're using GitHub, which a lot of uh, our customers are using, just going through their security checklist and enabling things, like enabling, putting it down a, um, your security file, your readme file, and explaining how to contact you if there's an issue or vulnerability, turning on the dependabot alerts, so when a dependency is compromised or there's a vulnerability discovered, you get a uh, thing that pops up that you can quickly look at it, validate, and, um, and pull, do a pull request on. So that's a, at the really basic level. I think when you get higher up, it really depends on the infrastructure you're using, right, and how you configure it. If you're using AWS, like Ben said, you can configure the security hub, kind of tie it to a service like um, PagerDuty and set it up so that when something happens, you're getting immediate notifications. And a lot of times it's just a queuing that setting your parameters so if there's an anomaly, your cue that something looks weird to get a human to look at it, right? It, the problem with modern software is it's it's so complex that you're really just looking for something that just breaks, as we'd say in the military, breaks squelch on radio to say, okay, this looks weird enough for me to send a pager out, and then I want to get my engineers to look at it and verify whether it's uh, whether it's malicious or not. 
Uh, ben, you want to add anything to that? I think the one tip, um, if you're using AWS, which a lot of people are, just um, look into using Assume Role for your team. By using Assume Role when teammates access AWS, you get a much broader CloudTrail log. Um, without using it, you don't get as much telemetry and then make sure that that CloudTrail log goes to some sort of alerting platform. Um, it's a great way to figure out if, you know, someone was to accidentally change like the firewall rules or um, something more malicious, but um, that's probably one tip. All right, Brenda Excellent. had a question. How do your tools work with OT or scatter networks operating the grid? Um, so, Brenda, I know we have some customers in the energy space. My actual brother-in-law works in the UK grid, and actually he told me that they had a cyber operation, and he had to tell him that there weren't many computers in the operating room. It was all mechanical. But I guess maybe the US grid is being updated. I'm not that familiar, but um, I'm sure our team would love to chat more. You know, the grid is digital and there's all these sort of interesting edge devices. So just reach out to goteleport.com um, and we're happy to chat more. And then for Esbon, yeah, do you want to take that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just say specifically on that, uh, Brenda, like the, uh, I don't know that we have any SCADA customers, but really with Package Cloud, we're talking about deploying software. So in most cases for those type of customers, we'd be in a situation where it'd probably be an on-premise uh, hosting that they can control within a network and firewall they have control over to distribute internal software within that network. Um, I think the thing with SCADA you always have to be careful of is any aperture where you're calling out really becomes a window uh, where there could be malicious ability to try to reach in and control that. So I don't think we have too many uh, customers using it for that specific reason. Yeah, the yeah same, you're, and uh, Brenda just uh, Brenda just added some are digital and some are serial connected. And you're absolutely right. So I think for the ones that are digital and serial connected, I think Teleport offers some pretty good options. And I think that it, it really depends if they're distributing or utilizing software, um, and that's where Package Cloud would come in. Excellent. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, at this point, I want to give each of you just a, a, a maybe thirty seconds. Uh, let's start with uh, Donnie. Uh, if, if nothing else, what would you like the audience to kind of take back with them or maybe just start doing tomorrow? Yeah, thanks, uh, Tom. I think the biggest thing is just, just know where your software is and just ask the question. If you're on a development team, it's worth just going to your team and just asking some of these questions like, do we have an SBOM? Like, how do we manage when a vulnerability pops like this? What are the pieces we're doing? So in many cases, you might not have the answer and your team may not have the answer, but just the process of asking the question opens a dialogue and let you highlight, you know what, we need maybe to step outside and get someone to come in who's got some expertise to talk about this. So try to know where your code comes from and ask smart questions to stimulate that discussion in your team so you can protect your protect your organization. Makes sense to me, I like it. Good, sensible advice. How about you, Ben? Oh, that's a great question, Tom. I just think, you know, just review the systems that you have working, many, both access systems and CID systems, they're often set up once and people forget about them. So maybe just like ping the engineer who's working on be like, when was the last time we actually updated X or Bob left the company last year, did we remove his like SSH keys? And then like sort of ask those questions, be like, okay, maybe time is to sort of clean things up and you know do your spring clean of your infrastructure. Good stuff, I like it. Be vigilant, be aware, find your stuff. I like it. It's good stuff. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen. I, I just uh, really good stuff. I mean, like I said, I learned a lot uh, today on a, a topic that I really didn't know a lot about. So I really appreciate it, you guys. Uh, made it clear for me. I really love the examples. The the pencil example really sold it for me. So like, oh, okay, now it makes sense. I get it. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Uh, we have a lot more uh, remote sessions coming up. Uh, we have, uh, let's see. Resolution intelligence for situational awareness. That's happening on Thursday, the 27th. Uh, data privacy insights. We've got a special one on Friday. Um, it's actually a uh, data privacy day on Sunday. So uh, very apt to have this one on Friday. So uh, we're doing that one. Uh, nuclear ransomware is coming up 3.0. We thought it was bad and then it got worse. Uh oh, uh, that one's uh, in February. So that one should be, I think that's a Roger Grimes. Uh, should be a fun one there. Uh, so link is in the resource tab there. You can sign up for any or all of those. 
again, want to say thank you to Donnie and Ben for just a great presentation and the folks over at Teleport for making today's remote session possible. Um, if you haven't already, uh, you can download your certificate of attendance. It's in that widget bar. Uh, look for the little thing that looks like a certificate. Um, but that should be good for one CPE credit. If you have any problems getting that, you can always email me, tom at secureworldexpo.com. Uh, this concludes today's remote session. We'll see you on Thursday. Great. Thanks, Tom.